I don't think we need to spend a lot of time introducing Ed Hare as president. His responsibility is management general administration of a $250 million family business, including sales, et cetera. He also oversees the company's activities in areas of charitable giving and community corporate relations. Ed, please come on up. Thank you. Hi, everybody. It's great, great to be here with you today. I uh, uh, am here today with my son, Jonathan, and uh, this is his first time here, my second time here. And I was telling Jonathan on the way up here that this is, uh, even though it's a small, smaller group, it's one of my favorite groups to be with. I love the energy in this room. And uh, so I'm, I'm happy to be here. It's always a real treat to be able to make a new friend. And uh, so we're, we're happy to be here today. And uh, I was also going to say that it's, you know, we, we live uh, about 50 miles south. So we're out in the country. And uh, so when we come into town, it's like, OK, where are we going to park? How's this going to work out, right? And it seems as though, uh, despite the best assistance a guy can have, I never leave enough time. And so I have a huge apology. I'm not sure how this is going to go across, because I can't exactly fix it. But so we came in town. We're a few minutes late. And I don't really like to be late, especially when Mark asked me to be here at 12 o'clock sharp. I uh, got to the parking garage and uh, had a, a little bit of a police escort in there. And I was thinking, we got to get we got. And I completely forgot that I had a big box of chips for you guys. <laughs> so I'm going to tell you, I'm going to tell you something. It has never been more evident to me that a sandwich has to have chips. <laughs> so I'm sorry about that. And uh, if, if I ever come back, uh, get invited back again, I'll, uh, I'll make sure to make that up to you. And uh, if, if, you get, if, you get, uh, if you get hungry for chips, uh, please make sure you look for the right ones. We're, we're, we're happy to be in Philadelphia today, too. I can tell you that uh, it's an exciting time to be in Philadelphia. And uh, it's a great city. I can't think of a better city that I'd rather be associated with. I'd rather try to sell chips in. You know, Philly, Philly is a great blue-collar town. The sports teams are doing great right now for the most part. Uh, what I love about Philly sports teams right now, and you guys would appreciate this too, because we value culture, is they're investing in locker rooms. They're investing in people that don't want to be, you know, first and foremost, but they want to help the team. And that's exciting. That's exciting to us. So it's a good time to be in Philadelphia. I thought maybe uh, today I'd share with you uh, a little bit about um, the history of our company uh, and maybe just a real quick snapshot of where we are today. And then uh, something that's been a big part of our company is to make sure that we pass this legacy on to the next generation. So my father started the company, as you'll hear, uh, 73 years ago. I'm second generation president and CEO. And now my job is to, to help facilitate a transition to the third generation of which Jonathan's part of and on the leadership track to, to him, him and three other cousin, cousins are going to be running our company someday. So um, it's an exciting time. I'll talk a little bit about transition. And then I have just a few uh, tidbits on leadership. I, I won't spend too much. I'm sure you've all heard plenty of leadership tips. But I'll just uh, leave, you with a, leave you with a couple. And then we'll make sure to um, save some time for Q&A. Am I getting any feedback here? Are we OK? Everything's good. OK. So in 1946, uh, 73 years ago, my dad was working on his dad's farm just outside of Lancaster, Pennsylvania, a little town called Willow Street. And they had a rule in their family that you had to work on the company farm until you were 21 years old with no pet. And then when you turn 21, you got a used car and the freedom to go work somewhere else if you wanted to. My dad saw an ad. Now, I have to say that his job on the farm was raising laying hens. So he had one big, long barn and 2,000 chickens, no people. So when dad turned 20 on, he said to his dad, dad loved working for you but I want to get around more people. <laughs> he saw an ad in the Lancaster newspaper, Verna's Potato Chip Company for sale for $1,725. He borrowed $1,725 f 
from his fiancées, John's grandmother, my mother, who our, both of our parents are deceased now, borrowed $1,725 from his fiancée's boss, who was a lawyer in downtown Lancaster. Bought Verna's potato chip company. The first mistake he made was he gave her the money up front before she showed him how to make potato chips. <laughs> So he had to figure out how to do that. But he did figure it out, as you've noticed. And his motivation in the early years were, was to pay that loan off so that his fiance uh, knew that he had credibility with her boss. So that's how it all started. So dad would make chips in these two big black kettles. He, he, for $1,725, he got a 1936 Dodge panel truck, a couple big black kettles, some equipment where he could slice potatoes by hand. And he started making potato chips in these black kettles. And then he would go pick up his fiance, my mother, and they would sell chips door to door in downtown Lancaster. And the way they did that, they put these chips in a three pound tin and they would set them on your doorstep. And there would be a little note inside that said, we hope you enjoy our delicious potato chips. If you would like another tin of these next week, please leave the money inside the tin. And that's how they started business. So if they went back to pick up the tin, if it had money in it, they left another one. If it didn't, then they did. So that's how, that's how it all started. Um, in the early days, uh, you know, Dad, like, like a lot of you entrepreneurs, worked a lot of hours. You know, from, sometimes he said they'd work from 4 or 5 in the morning until 11 o'clock at night. And money was tight. Sometimes they lived on potato soup. But they, they had a great time building a business together. And eventually, they grew out of selling door-to-door door door in downtown Lancaster. Sometimes they would go to the market. But then around that time, in the late 40s, uh, they were starting to develop these mom-and-pop stores, little supermarkets. So dad started driving. From, I'm, not, I'm not sure why there wasn't uh, as much opportunity in his mind in Lancaster. But he started driving from Lancaster to Wilmington, Delaware, and selling chips to different accounts down there. One day, he was coming back from one. So now, he has one person working for him, making the chips. And he's out selling, out with the people, right? So one day, he's coming back from selling in his chip truck. And he gets about a mile from where the chip factory is, and or the little, the little thing that was supposed to be a chip factory, right? And he sees smoke, and, and he asks them, you know, back then there's no cell phones. What's going on up there? Oh, the, the, the little potato chip factory's on fire. So uh, he figured out a way to get up there, only to find out that the chip factory burnt to the ground. The good news was that uh, his wife now at the time and two little children, my older brother and sister, were fine. The employee was fine, uh, but the chip factory was gone. So an insurance company... Uh, an insurance adjuster showed up the next day with a check for $4,000. So this is the value of your company. So dad and mother had a decision to make. Should we, should we take this $4,000 and reinvest, keep the company going, or should we just buy a farm like everybody else in our family is doing? <laughs> Obviously, they decided to keep the chip factory going. And they moved to Nottingham, Pennsylvania, uh, which is where we are today. And uh, one of the reasons they did that was because they picked Nottingham was because their church at the time uh, was, was looking for some young couples to go start another church. And so they, they said, well, we'll move, to, we'll move to, uh, down to Nottingham, and uh, we'll help start that little church. And so they borrowed more money, built a little factory in Nottingham. That's how we, that's how we got to Nottingham. <coughs> little did he know at the time that Nottingham would be the perfect spot to develop their little business. There was some arterial highway access. And so then, not only selling chips in Wilmington, dad began to sell chips in Philadelphia. And he drove right up Route 1 to Philadelphia. And Philadelphia market was owned by Wise Potato Chips. All right? Wise Potato Chips, by design, were a potato chip that was darker, uh, a little, a little uh, greasier. And it had a very distinct, good, but distinct flavor. Dad developed a marketing campaign on his bags and his little barrels that said, Hers potato chips, lively, light, and delicious. Light meaning light in color. And so he sourced potatoes and learned how to 
make potato chips that were lighter and not darker. The only thing, by the way, that makes a chip dark is if it has more sugar in it. And that has to do with how you care for the potato and how you buy potatoes, all this stuff. So he made, by design, a lively, light, and delicious chip. And things started to take off in Philadelphia. And we grew, and we grew, and we grew. Philadelphia is a great snack food market. So um, after, after Philadelphia started to, to take off a little bit, then we started to branch out. And so we put these branches. Uh, I, I'll never forget, I was 12 years old at the time, and Dad was going to do his first branch in New Jersey. So I remember going there with him one day, and uh, we were riding in, a, in our first tractor trailer, and we went over the Delaware Memorial Bridge, and that was big stuff. And uh, so there was an account down there called Heritage. The Heritage family had convenience stores, in, and they were going to put our chips in their stores. So we went over the bridge. So we developed a branch there, and then Central Jersey, and then North Jersey, and then different places in Pennsylvania and all around. So now today we have 20 of those branch locations uh, in the Philadelphia, we call it, we call it kind of the mid-Atlantic market, which involves you know, eight, or, eight or 10 states in, in this area. So um, today, uh, the way our business is, is kind of set up, um, we, have, we have this mid-Atlantic region, which is about 62% of our business. And that's where we ship product from Nottingham manufacturing facility to these branches and then distribute them, distribute the chips directly to the store, put them on the shelf, everything. So you see all these little trucks running around that says, you know, hers forever, good or whatever. And, and, and so that's 60% of our business. Then the other 40% of our business is made up of national and international. So uh, what also happens in our business is we have, we have customers that we make product for that are in different parts of the country. It might be somebody like Walmart that just wants to buy pallets, or somebody like Target that wants to buy pallets and will ship them to their distribution center. Or it could be we have some uh, special customers where we'll co-brand. We're very interested in our brand, but we do do some co-branding for a company like Market Basket in Boston, HEB down in Texas. And, and so we'll, we'll ship product directly to them under their brand uh, as long as they're interested in really good quality. And then the, the latest kind of, uh, maybe phenomenon is too strong a word, but we started selling internationally. It's the smallest piece of our business, but the fastest growing. So what's happening in our world today is that in a lot of countries, uh, they love the idea of a product made in the USA. And if it's made by an American family, then that's even better. So uh, we're starting to market our products, our brand, uh, in other countries. And to, so today we're in 49, 49 countries uh, doing that. So, We've grown from, from this little company that was a one-man and, 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 I should say, a two-person operation because, as John would attest, our, my mother, his grandma, was so involved in the business, such a big part of the business. You can't say dad without saying mom. Uh, so it grew from that to today where we have 1,500, 1500 employees. So uh, uh, still a relatively small company, but it's moved a lot in, in, in two generations. And uh, so back then, Dad was making about 30 pounds of chips a day. And today, we're making between five and six tons of chips an hour. So uh, keep, keep eating those chips. And I, 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 I. So uh, we are a uh, private family business. Uh, there are no uh, outside, uh, no, no public shareholders. Uh, we have five family members in the second generation. Uh, I, I think I mentioned earlier, but just to be clear, uh, my dad died about six years ago. Mom died about two and almost three years ago, two and a half years ago. And uh, uh, so uh, we have the five, uh, my four brothers and sisters that are on our board of directors. And then we also have um, five outside board of directors because we believe it's very important to hold ourselves accountable. So even though we're a private company, we bring people in from the outside to help us to learn how to do things. We have a guy that was the president of Turkey Hill uh, Dairies. We have a guy that was the president of a pretty big tech company. We have a guy that was uh, a chief global strategist for Campbell, a guy that was the CEO of Snyder's Lance on our board. So we have a lot of uh, kind of heavy hitters that are there to hold me accountable and to make sure that we have the right plans and strategy in place to be successful into the next generation. 
Uh, so my brother Jim is the chairman of our board for another couple of years, and then I serve as president and CEO. And then I have a younger brother that's in charge of all the potato procurement, and he also is the gatekeeper to our J.S. Her Family Foundation. Then we have a brother-in-law that's about my age that is running our sales and marketing. And then we have 11 third-generation family members, four of which I mentioned John's part of. They're on a leadership track, and then some others that are just working in, in various jobs in the company. So definitely, definitely a family affair, um, and uh, it's, it's, it's a lot of fun. So uh, when I think about transition, and I think about you know uh, what is it that uh, I think uh, is making us successful going into next generation. Uh, a couple things come to mind. And uh, I would say, uh, first of all, it's a very humbling experience because, um, as you guys probably can attest, uh, it, 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 it's not easy always working with family. Uh, we, we've been fortunate in that our family gets along so well, but it's a big job. It's a big job. I spend a lot of time working on relationships and you know, uh, communication, that sort of thing. But it's very important uh, for our second generation to give the third generation the same opportunity we've had to work together, to run a family business, to run a private enterprise where you can make decisions that can benefit not only your family, but the families of 1,500 employees. So uh, it's a great honor to be able to have that uh, kind of influence in your life and to be able to work together at it. It can bring a family uh, closer together. So we try to be very intentional about passing on our family legacy. And uh, it also becomes, uh, frankly, uh, I'd, I'd like to see it become more and more of a point of differentiation in the marketplace so that everybody in Philadelphia that's buying our chips knows that it's a family business and we care about our legacy and we care about serving the great customers of, of Philadelphia. So um, what kind of things do we do? I, I can tell you. Uh, first of all, my brother, Jim, who's our executive chairman, he is super great at being intentional about estate planning, about um, uh, 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 succession planning. And, and so he's, he's brought in a lot of experts to help us to do this thing well. He's been very attentive. So it takes intentionality, first of all. And uh, then I put together, uh, that's kind of overarching, I put to, uh, uh, together a list of seven things. Some of them will be very, very brief. But uh, seven things that I think help us to transition into the next generation. The first one is, is, is our culture. It's, it's, our, it's, our, it's our family culture. And uh, uh, you know, for, for us, uh, our values, uh, much like your values, come from our heritage. Uh, in, 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 in your heritage, it would be, for most of you probably, uh, along the, the bloodlines of Jewish Jewish ancestors and families and, and values. For us, we, we come from a Protestant background. So, so our values come kind of from that foundation. Uh, I, and, and I don't say that to say that um, you, know, you can't have the values that our business has if you're not Protestant, because I don't believe that. So I'm just saying that that's one of the things that helps shape, shape us, just like your values help shape your business and your job, your career, that sort of thing. So um, we have a very close family. Uh, we've been fortunate that way. Uh, our, our family, uh, my parents did such a good job raising us kids. I'm telling you, it was such a happy life. I used to watch Leave it to Beaver and feel sorry for him. And, uh, and it's a very loving, loving family, very orderly. My mom was, you know, she just had things very, very much in control. Uh, uh, we knew what to expect. It was a very respectful family, still is. A lot of integrity, like, like all of you, I'm sure it's an important part of your life. And, and, and hard working, you know, just, just loved working hard. I, I tell people, I can remember uh, when it wasn't a school day, it was a Saturday, and, and, and we, we would get up and we would have a work day and then play day. So we would all work together as a family, sweeping the blacktop or raking leaves or whatever until one o'clock. And then we would have lunch, and then we could play. And, and, and believe me, I couldn't tell which one I liked better because mom and dad made it so much fun to work. And so, you know, I'd sweep the blacktop, and my mom would come over and say, that looks so great, Ed. And I felt so purposeful in what I was doing. I was like, I don't know if I want to go mess around playing. 
you know? It, so, so the value of hard work was instilled in us to where we just, we just enjoyed it. We just enjoyed having the purpose of hard work. So pretty important part of our culture. Uh, so we try to keep that culture alive and talk about our values with the next generation and have uh, good communication, keep everybody updated. We have uh, family get-togethers. Uh, this, this year, uh, 70, almost 75 of us, I think, are going up to Hotel Hershey, and we're going to have a three-day retreat. And we're going to talk to each other about what's going on in our lives, what's going on in the business that we're all part of, what's going on in the industry that we're a part of. And, and so we do a lot of that communication. About five times a year, we get the family together for a holiday. And uh, you know, just, just kind of keep communication alive and make sure people understand what's going on. Um, and then uh, uh, the, the second one I was going to say is uh, that we have, uh, out of 20 descendants, I, I kind of mentioned this earlier, but uh, we have 11 of those third generation, 20 descendants that are working in a company. And that's, that's probably a little bit high for the average uh, third generation family business. But um, we're really proud of that. And, and, and uh, we try to be uh, intentional in encouraging third generation family members to join the company. Frankly, we believe that if you don't encourage, you're actually discouraging. So if nobody comes to you and asks you and says, I really want you to consider working at the family business, you're going to assume that you're not invited. So we try to be very intentional about encouraging family members to not only work with the company, but you know, to get more and more involved. And we think that, that more involvement, so if we, have, if we have representation from all of my brothers and sisters' family working at the company, that creates an environment where there's more interest in the family business because everybody has, uh, everybody has a player on the team. And so we're, we, we stay interested all, all together. Uh, could you have too many uh, family members involved in the business? I guess uh, you could. Uh, for us, you know, it's like 0.6 if you figure the amount of family members compared to 1,500. What's more important is how many family members are in leadership, and if they're in leadership, how many, uh, uh, for instance, on my executive team, I have six executives, and then I have three family members that are coming in on the third generation. So that's a total of nine, three of which are family members, not counting me. So the key there is we have to make darn sure that if you're not a family member, you feel just as big a piece of the business as if you are a family member. So if you're the senior VP of, of, uh, of uh, manufacturing and you're not a family member, you need to feel you're just as much a part of it as the senior VP of sales and marketing that is a family member. So try to make sure that we, again, it goes back to valuing people and respecting people. So that's number two. Number three is that we have a family employment policy. And family employment policies can have all kinds of things in them. In, in our uh, family employment uh, policy, it has things like entry-level employment, uh, like what the rules are for that. It has uh, the, the criteria for if, if you want to work at the company, here's what you have to do. Here's the rules you have to play by. It has criteria for if you want to be in leadership, like Jonathan knows, if he wants to be on a track, we call it trackers. If you want to be on a track to be in leadership, then you have to have a certain amount of schooling. You have to have outside experience. You have to prove yourself every step of the way through each, through each part, of the, part of the company. Um, and, and, and these things are important to us. It's, it's, it's very rare that we don't follow the employment policy. If we do make an exception, there has to be a unified agreement to it. So uh, that's, that's very important to us. And then um, you know, family employment policies can, can talk about you know, compensation and all kinds, of, all kinds of other things. The fourth one I was just going to mention is what we call a family constitution. So we have a family constitution, too, which talks about uh, what relationships look like in our culture, what our core values are, what the governance of the company is like. So a family constitution is very important uh, for, those, for those reasons. We also have um, uh, shareholder expectations that are passed on to the board. So it's very important that our board of directors, having five outside board members, knows what the direction is from the trustees, which are the shareholders in the second generation. So second generation 
very important for them to communicate to the board, here's our expectations for the company's performance. So that gives the marching orders, that gives the structure to the board, and then the board can hold me accountable to what, to what the shareholders are looking for. So shareholder expectations number five. Number six is paying dividends. Um, uh, the, the important part about paying dividends is it reminds all of your shareholders, which our company has a ton of family shareholders, it reminds all of them of what the company performance is, and it's also a nice little reminder that they have a responsibility to the company as well. So it kind of keeps everybody interested in what's going on, and it's just a reminder, even if you're not working for us, say a prayer for us, right, because, because you're a piece of it, right? So that's, that's number six, and number seven, I kind of alluded to earlier, Probably goes without saying, but any transition is going to have to have experts involved. So we, we are a company, uh, uh, my brother Jim was an expert at this. We're a company of learners. We don't have it all figured out. We want to be humble. We want to ask for people's advice. We realize that there are people that have a lot more expertise in family business planning, succession planning, estate planning than we do. So we hire the best people we can find to help us with that, to give us good advice so that we can make the decision. So um, that's a little bit on transition. And then uh, I think what I'll do is talk a little bit about, about leadership, and then, uh, and then I'll open it up for, uh, for questions. And uh, uh, this I'll try to do in, in like about, about five minutes. Are we, are we okay that way? Yeah, okay. So uh, the first thing uh, I was going to say about leadership, and it's probably my most, most important one, uh, is that I think whether, whether you are uh, a part of a family, a marriage, an organization, a nonprofit organization, or a business, uh, leadership is about being a great person. It's about being a great person. I don't care what your role is or what your responsibility is, it's about being a great person. And the, probably the best thing I learned from my mom and dad as far as leadership, was that you have to love people. You have to love people. And so that sounds, it sounds kind of corny in a way, right? To say, you know, what, what's this, this, this uh, you know, uh, president CEO saying, well, here's the answer, you got to love people. But it's true. Now, if you think about it, um, people don't, care how much you know unless they know how much you care. You've heard that before. And uh, so if I'm trying to make a decision on employee policy or something like that, I got to follow that golden rule. I got to put myself in the shoes of who it's going to affect and say, you know, so that's loving people. Uh, I have to listen to my people, respect them, value their opinion. All that is what I mean by we have to love people. Now, here's, here's where uh, it gets kind of like to the, to the bottom line for me. Um, and you know, uh, in my heart, I feel about as close as I could to you, as close to you as I do my, my Protestant brothers and sisters. So I'm saying this as, as a brother to all of you in this room. But you know, there's, there's 613 commandments in the Bible. Some in the Old Testament, some in the New Testament. 613. And so one day, you know, however... You regard Jesus. He was a leader. And one day, they say to Jesus, right, like, okay, 613, what's the most important one? And he said, look, it comes down to these two. Love the Lord your God with all your heart and soul and mind, and love your neighbor as yourself, right? He said, everything else hangs on those two things. Everything else we do hangs on those two things. So, um, that's why, for me, I said, you know, when, when I have tough decisions, whether it's relationships, people that are very powerful, button heads, it always comes down to how can I love them in the most significant way, put myself in their shoes, try to figure out what they're thinking, where they're coming from, what's their character profile, what's their decision-making process. That's loving people. And then I can make a good decision. I can be a good leader. But I have to care. I have to care. And that's the thing my parents taught me whether it was delegating, trusting people, building relationships with neighbors, at church, whatever. They loved people. That's my number one. Number two is integrity. Always doing the right thing when nobody's watching. Dad had, uh, 
uh, relationship with a farmer one day. He bought, he bought this farmer's field, uh, a crop of potatoes. All the acres this farmer could grow. He said, I'm going to buy all of your potatoes for this year. It started raining like last year. And it rained and rained and rained. And by the time harvest came, all the potatoes were rotten. What do you think dad did? Paid the guy. He paid the guy. Integrity. Integrity builds trust. If you have trust, you have transparency, you have collaboration, you have culture, you have team, you have energy. And then uh, I, I, uh, I always think it's important, like I said, no matter what you're doing, whether, whether you're just being a wife or a husband or a friend, it, it takes being your best, being your best person. And uh, it's different for everybody what being your best looks like. You know? But I contend that sometimes being our best is really simple. We just make it really hard. For instance, um, there, are, there are three things that any doctor or psychologist or expert of health will tell you that you need to do to have a good life, to be healthy, to be happy, to be productive. And those three things are uh, eat right, small, small bags of chips, right? <laughs> eat right, exercise, and get your rest. Now, those three things, you don't have to have, right, Ethan? You don't have to have a master's degree to do that. You don't have to be smart. But what you have to have is discipline. And I guarantee you, most people, can't do those three things right for even 30 days. And I challenge people. I say, you want to change your life, take 60 days and do those three things really well. Now, I don't, want, I don't know what it looks like for you to eat healthy or to get your rest or to exercise. I don't know what it looks like. It's different for everyone. Do those three things for 60 See how you feel. See what kind of decisions you make. See what kind of energy you have. See what kind of influence you have in the world around you. I have a friend, Mike Quick. He's a, he was a wide receiver for the Eagles, five-time All-Pro, first-round draft pick, one of my best friends. I said, Mike, was there ever a time in your life where you had to dig deep? Because I've been around Mike enough to know that everything sports-related comes easy to him. If, you, if, he sees, if he sees a putt, if he's playing in a scramble and three of us miss it left or right, he won't miss it. He's got such great hands. He, he played four sports all through high school, got, a, got a, a scholarship to North Carolina, went to North Carolina on a football scholarship, broke all the track records. But he said, Ed, there was a time in my life when I had to dig deep, and I had to do something that made me my best, but it was so simple. Anybody could have done it, but it was hard to do. And he said, when I was 11th, when I was a junior in college, North Carolina State, I was a junior, I always get mixed up, North Carolina State or North Carolina, anyway. He was a junior in college, and he realized he had a shot at being a first-round draft pick. And he said, you know what I did? Every night after school and after football practice, it'd be 8.30, and I went to bed. Everybody else was going out, having a good time. I went to bed at 8.30 every night. And he said, you wouldn't believe how that changed my projection, how it changed my performance. Just going to bed, 8.30, there again, not hard, simple, but we can, anyway, being our best. The last thing I'm going to leave you with, and I'm going to stop, is that uh, we always think in, in our company, and, and I, I, I just love uh, uh, working on this and have to do it better and better, but the whole idea of humility and being interested in the opinions of others, I just think is a key to leadership. Uh, if you read uh, Colin's book on good to great, he'll tell you, that most great leaders are very humble people. They care about their family. They care about the people around them. And uh, so that's my last uh, uh, leadership principle. I think it's very important. And I want to thank you guys for having me back today. And, and uh, uh, thanks for being good listeners. So thank you.
Um, taking care of farmers is, is obviously one of the most important things that I, I believe you can do. How do you, number one, how do you ensure that you're putting your farmers first? And you know, you're, you're constantly reminding folks like us here in the city that you know, our potato chips come from farmers. And, and how, do you, how do you, what's the best way to articulate that? And, and, how, does, and how does that resonate for folks like us? My second question is, is sort of related to that is how do you ensure quality through your supply chain? So I mean, I've grown up eating your potato chips. I think everybody in the room has. And I know that hers are you know, a quality product. How do you, what steps do you take to ensure that that's consistent and, and that you're creating a consistent product? Thank you. Uh, did everybody hear that? Yeah. We're all good? So uh, the first thing, we, we, use, uh, we use brokers, uh, the same brokers we've been using for 60 years. They buy 95% of our potatoes from farmers up and down the East Coast. And uh, uh, so this time of year, right now, uh, just for your information, actually the number one most commonly asked question is, where do you get your potatoes from? And, and so I'll, I'll, I'll spin that off to answer your question. So right now, this time of year, potatoes are a 90-day crop. They plant them in January in South Florida. This time of year, they're just starting to harvest. So we're getting potatoes fresh from Florida. And then we follow that, we follow that harvest right up the East Coast, all the way up to, to uh, New York and then Michigan. And then those potatoes can be stored in 52 degrees, certain humidity, all winter. So we're always running fresh potatoes. But uh, it is important to have a good relationship with your farmers. Now, we have the same farmers, families, just like us, that have been running these family farms, 500 acres here, 500 acres here, for years. And so my brother, who's in charge of potato procurement, he'll spend time. He'll go down to Florida. My dad used to do it, go down to Florida for April 6th was their anniversary. They'd always go down and look at the potato fields because if you, have, if you haven't seen a potato field, it's very pretty. It's got white blossoms and it's really a sight to be seen, a uh, sight to see. But anyway, so building relationships with our farmers, uh, same things in terms of <coughs> leadership, integrity, uh, building trust with them, uh, paying the going price, those kind of things. There's kind of, so we have farmers that say, we don't want to grow for anybody else other than her. You know, um, so uh, that's, that's that. And then uh, on, uh, on quality, uh, I think probably, uh, you know, we, we do taste tests. You know, we're always testing ourselves against our competitors. Uh, we have quality checks. We have a whole quality team. They're, they're testing uh, salt levels, uh, oil levels, moisture levels, uh, all these kind of things. Uh, I don't know, John. I think it's every hour, isn't it? Every hour we're doing these. We're doing these tests in the plant, and uh, and then we do we do our own taste test where we compare ourselves against others. And uh, you know, the thing I do with quality too, I, I leave that the person that's in charge of quality reports directly to me. He doesn't report to the manufacturing person or R and D person. Quality reports directly to the president, CEO. So in that way, uh, you give them the freedom to. Uh, you know, structurally make decisions, and, and so uh, that, that's what works for us. Next question. Um, hi, I'm Natalie. Hi, Natalie. Um, so I'm again, a big fan of potatoes and potato chips and hers in general. Um, what steps is the company taking to become a zero waste company? Because um, obviously with food production, there's waste in terms of the food, like oil, skins, and yeah. potatoes. But there's also the waste in terms of transportation with the trucks. So um, what steps is the company taking to become yeah. It, would you say, Natalie, that zero waste is a close cousin to just the whole environment in general? Absolutely. Absolutely. Like part of the so, loop process. So my biggest frustration is we don't have a potato chip bag that's biodegradable. We just, John and I and a couple others, were just down at, 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 a, at a snack food convention. You can imagine what that's like. <laughs> but, uh, we were just down there, and, and one of the subjects on the floor was, you know, who's, who's working on biodegradable, and they do have packages. Problem, Natalie, is the consumer has to be willing to pay more for it. That's where the rubber meets the road. So you and I can say, gosh, we'd love to have this product, this package be biodegradable, but if I have to pay 12 cents more for it, or a dollar more for it, or whatever it is, then that's, that's where it gets, it gets tough. But I can tell you that you know, we love anything that's related to the environment. For instance, I tell you, great story. I might have told this story before when I was here. It's one of my favorites. But um, so, so besides doing things like K2 
capturing the steam that's, that goes up the stacks from cooking potato chips uh, and converting it into heat for our facilities, taking all of our cardboard and recycling it, uh, all kinds of things like that that we do. You know, uh, um, what, what, what do they call the new lights? The, um, LED. LED lights, all that. Everything we can think of, we do. But my favorite story, <coughs> when I was just a little guy, uh, you know, my, my dad had a lot of principles, just like all of you. And he had this neighbor, his name was Johnny Clemens. And Johnny Clemens would come in to this, to this factory and get all of our old cardboard. This is before we recycled. His recycling was to take the cardboard to his hog farm and use it for bedding. I understand sometimes pigs would even eat the cardboard. But anyway, he would, he would come in. But the thing about John that was interesting is he didn't subscribe to any of my dad's principles. He was a heavy drinker. He was a smoker. He taught me how to cuss, all these things. You know? And he'd flick a cigarette. And I would say to myself, why does dad put up with it? You know, like, why? But dad, like I said earlier, he loved people. So he could look past where Johnny was. And he said, I just want to help him. I like his little farm down the road. I, li I like how he takes care of his pigs. I like him and his wife, blah, blah, blah. So guess what happened? When John was close to uh, passing away, he told his wife, there's only one person that can buy my farm if he wants to. And it was dad. So dad buys this farm, 87 acres, uh, right, right, almost right next door to, to our plant. Turns out, two years later, somebody working in manufacturing knocks on dad's door and says, hey, you know that farm you bought a little? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, there's this old mine shaft down there where they used to mine chrome. And, and it's full of water, and we want to hire the fire company to come pump the water out of it so we can see what's down there. We're just curious. So they hired a fire company. The fire company sent one truck, two trucks, two trucks. As much as they pumped, the water just kept coming. What happened was we tapped into an underground aquifer. This underground aquifer feeds all of our plant to this day. We use 150,000 gallons of water a day. All of it comes to us free <laughs> out of that aquifer because of a relationship, because of loving people, right? So now, in answer to your question, Dad said, gosh, we have this, we have this gift from the Lord, right? What are we going to do with it? What is, what is good stewardship? when you have free water. So he said, let's figure out a way to put this water back into the ground. So what we do is, and we've been doing this for years, we have what we call her Angus farm. And we take all the water that, that we use to wash and peel the potatoes, and we spray irrigate it back onto the ground. We grow reeds canary grass, which feeds the cattle. We also collect up all the, all the scraps in the factory. We call it a steer party mix. Feed that to the, to the steers. And, and uh, so, uh, in this way, we're replenishing that aquifer and, and, and putting, it, putting it back in the ground. That's, that's my favorite story on the environment. Thanks, Natalie. Yeah, um, the trend in the uh, food business lately, the uh, last several years, has been uh, towards lower fat foods and uh, you know, healthier foods and things like that. I don't know if pertaining to fall in that category. Yeah. Uh, how do you market and how do you, you know, how do you sell in that type of environment where people are trying to eat healthier? Yeah. Okay. What, what do you do for that? Okay. Well, there's a couple things on that. Number, number one is probably the, the best thing to realize is that people say one thing and do something else. <laughs> so, so um, and, and uh, so there's a lot. So take, take millennials today. Millennials are huge snack consumers, but they want to be healthy. So they're active, right? They're active. So they, they might eat a few less snacks, but you know, no, 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 no worries there. Um, now, we do have, uh, you know, what, what's, th then there's the thing, the next generation, what's perceived as healthier? So if you look up, if you look up the healthy snack category, you know what's the top of the list? Popcorn. All right? So skinny pop is a phenomenon that grew from zero to half the, actually two thirds the size of our company <coughs> within a couple of years because of the name Skinny Pop. It has more fat in it than potato chips do, <laughs> right? But the perception is that it's healthy. So that's, if that's a healthier product, we're in, you know? <laughs> but then there's another grade of healthier, which is lower fat, lower sodium, 
those kind of things. So we're always you know, taking MSG out. We're always tweaking our product to make them more for the health conscious consumer. Just keep an eye on what people are shopping for. But at the end of the day, we make what consumers buy. Believe me, if I found out that consumers wanted to eat a really healthy product and I could make money on it, like that's what we'd make. But at the end of the day, you know, we, we've tried to make things that are super healthy, but sometimes they just don't sell. So that's, that's the balance, sir. So I guess one of the things of being a business owner is you take a lot of risks um, when you're coming up with new products. Maybe you could share a chip that you tried to, to release. You thought it was going to be amazing, and people didn't like that. That's the first part. And the second part is, can you give us a hint of something you might be working on in the future for a new chip? Because I'm a chip at all. <laughs> okay, thank you. Yeah. Uh, okay, so first of all, the thing that comes to my mind was, uh, you know, cheese curls. I tell you guys, just off the record, we make the best cheese curls. Like, <laughs> you don't, you don't, you don't even have to compare them. I'm just telling you, you you want a good cheese curl, you get a bag of hers cheese curl. If you like spicy, get the jalapeno poppers. <laughs> Number one best selling flavor we have: jalapeno popper cheese curl. Anyway, um, years ago, probably, probably, 20, 15, 20 years ago. I think I was just, just kind of working my way up. And uh, we decided that these cheese curls were a kid's snack, right? Uh, since then, we've expanded our horizons a little bit. But they, they are a kid's snack. So um, R&D got this idea. If, if kids like cheese curls, why don't we make a cheese curl that's sweet? So now, now today we actually do have a honey cheese curl that's selling really well. But back then, the idea was let's make a choco curl. <laughs> so it was it was all the things you would like. It was chocolate, <laughs> peanut butter, flavoring. You know, just flavoring. And 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 when we ate this thing in R and D, I was like, man, we're we're gonna we're gonna knock this thing out of the park. And uh, as you can imagine, we put it out there, and it just totally flopped. We just couldn't couldn't sell it. So that that happens sometimes. By and large, what happens more? I'm sorry I didn't catch your name. What happens more is that we put products out there that just do so so, and then it's hard to know should we pull it or should we leave it out there. Now the favorite one that I've come out with that I'll just plug here for a second is our new pub style pretzel. Have you ever have a hey, show of hands? How many here? Check this out, John. How many here? <laughs> I didn't mean to point my finger like that, but. How many people here have tried the pub style pretzel? Look at that. That's amazing. We're selling a couple million dollars worth of pub style pretzels, but I tell our people it's the best pretzel on the market and nobody's tried it yet. We think everybody's tried it because we've had it out there. It's on the shelf. We've done ads. I've done ads. And, and still, 90% of you have never heard of it. Isn't that amazing? So. This is a testament to a new product. Man, if you have something, like I think I still say it's the best pretzel on the market, try it sometime. And here we are, you know, uh, thinking, you know, how much more could it do because we haven't marketed it properly. So I hope that answers your question. Okay, thank you, Sir. Uh, Andrew. Hi, Andrew. The uh, honey cheese uh, curls are my favorite here. Oh, thank you. <laughs> uh, absolutely amazing. My question is, when you talk about uh, culture and value of the family, how do you execute that down to the lowest rank? This is a, a delivery driver. You know, you, from the corporate level, also down to... That's a good question. Level. Thanks, Andrew. So how do, you, how do you pass that culture down to the lowest, lowest level or the most important level? But, so here's, here's the practicality of it, Andrew. So my brother Jim and... My dad and myself worked together at the top level for 40 years, roughly. We never went home angry. We never raised our voices at each other. Not saying we couldn't, but we didn't. And so this is what people that report to me got used to, because I would treat them the same way my older brother and my dad would treat me. So. My executive team got treated like 
my brothers, my sons, people like that. Same way. Now, I'm not, you know, don't get me wrong. We're not perfect. But I'm just saying, they, they experienced the same culture that we did as a family. And so if you, if you play that forward, Andrew, and you get down to the person on the route, and I'm out, I'm out visiting a route, and that route salesperson knows our family because he hears me talking about it or reads in a newsletter or something, and he says, you know, I don't think my manager treats me quite the way you and your brothers treat each other. Then that, that ra raises a red flag. So I'm just saying that to say, like, it just happens automatically if it's solid at the top, right? And you have the system that gives feedback? Yeah. yeah. Oh, yeah, we have employee surveys. We just did a big employee engagement survey not too long ago. And, yeah, go ahead, Mark. I'm sorry. Uh, <coughs> actually, mine's more of a comment that you could add to your list based on the story. So I forget how many years back, when I was at your uh, business, I was with your brother, JM, and we were down at the uh, downstairs where you have all the potato chips Snack, yeah. out there, yeah. And he looked at one, he was showing it to me, he said, you know, the color doesn't look right. And so are you, I would say the attention to detail uh -huh. is also a hallmark. Yeah, that's true, Mark. And, and a greeting to your success. Yeah, yeah. Thank, Thank you. you.